If you'll open your Bibles to the book of Titus, we're currently studying through this epistle. Uh, We'll continue our study there this morning, and I just want to bring you back. We looked at Titus 1, 1 through 4, one of these rich introductions to one of Paul's epistles. It it kind of was like a vacuum-packed passage. As we opened it up, it just kind of sprang out of the depth of what was in it. Paul is opening up his heart and he's sharing his commitments. He's really kind of a grandfather sitting you on his lap uh, saying, here's how I think. This is what drives me. Here's my motivations. Here's my philosophies of ministry. And so we saw some beautiful things in this opening. One of those commitments, Paul said, is I have a, a commitment to the faith of those who have been chosen of God. I've given my life to preach this gospel so the elect of God will call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And because God has elect from every tribe, tongue, and nation, this gospel is to go to the world. And so Paul has this devotion and this commitment to keep preaching this gospel so the elect will believe upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Another one of his commitments was he said, I am committed to the knowledge of the truth which is according to to godliness. That is what Paul is really after in this letter to Titus. There's this beautiful marriage between truth and the fruit that truth produces in a life, truth that transforms. And so Paul wants the church in Crete to manifest the fruit of those under the rule and the reign of Jesus Christ. There's chaos in the churches. And he's saying, Titus, I want you to put these things in order to Christ-likeness, to orderliness, when you order your lives under the King, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the way things are supposed to be when they are ordered under God. Lives that are not out of control, but lives that are controlled by God. He does not want the church of God to be a bad testimony of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in Titus 2 5, telling the older women to teach the younger women so that the word of God will not be dishonored, so that these younger ladies will be living in a way that they will not disfame or, or blacken the name of God to the world. So, this is this truth then that accords with godliness. Paul was given to the teaching of this word for the edification of the saints of God. He's going to call older men to teach the younger men in chapter 2 and the older women to teach the younger women and to disciple. And that is to produce the fruit of godliness. Not so you can say, well, I disciple women, I disciple men. He's saying, so it will bring about the younger ones living in such a way that they will put on display the glories and the grace of our God. And that is why Titus has been sent here. Crete is under attack. They're under attack by a false gospel. The the very gospel of Jesus Christ is under attack on this island by the Judaizers. So what do we do? So what do we do to just fix some things up? Let's correct the church, a little moral reform, just start trying harder. No, truth being taught that accords with godliness. Appoint elders and have them teach and preach truth that will bring about this fruit of godliness and orderliness under the lordship of Jesus Christ. Sound doctrine to bring about sound living. And so this morning we're going to see that the church needs elders. Not just what we looked at last week. Last week we saw the role model of the elder, hallelujah. But just looking at a role model is not going to help you one iota except maybe frustrate you. How do these men get this kind of character is my question. Where did it come from? And Titus is being told by Paul, by truth that accords with godliness. There is truth in the Word of God that will bring about these kind of lives. So last week, we saw what godliness looks like. Look with me in Titus 1, verse 5. For this reason I left you in Crete, that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. Namely, if any man is above reproach, the husband of one wife, having children who believe, not accused of dissipation or rebellion. For the overseer must be above reproach as God's steward, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not addicted to wine, not pugnacious, and not fond of sordid gain, but rather hospitable, loving what is good, sensible, just, devout, and self-controlled. And so last week we began to look at the character of of one of these men and and what God is doing to produce in them to be leaders in the church. And so the way that this kind of man is produced, I don't want you to miss this, is by the knowledge of the truth. 
that, that has left him at the feet of Jesus Christ, beholding him being metamorphosed into his image. So it's a man who has tasted of the gospel and it's sweet. He treasures it. He lives it. It's transforming every area of his life. And that is then what he brings to his wife and children, the gospel. These sacred writings that lead to the knowledge of salvation. I didn't try to just clean up my little lambs that God gave me to be morally good kids, but I brought the gospel of Jesus Christ that accords with godliness. That's tying this whole thing together. The truth of the gospel giving me integrity and character from the inside to the outside, from my dealings in my own heart to my dealings with others. That truth is changing me into the image of Jesus Christ. And that is why this last qualification of an elder is so important then. We need men who have been called of God to teach and to preach this gospel, to preach the word of God, to teach the whole counsel of God. When I say the gospel, I am talking about from Genesis to Revelation. Paul says, as we have received mercy, so we preach. Because I've tasted of this and I've experienced it and I've been transformed by God, I preach it. I preach the mercy that has transformed me. This is the gift of teaching. You teach this word that accords with godliness. And if people get what you are teaching, they become like him. So it's not just making people smarter, but when you teach this word, people get changed and conform to his image. This is not just like doctrine in and godliness comes out. But Paul is saying we sow this truth again and again and again, and we pray that the Spirit of God will illuminate the truth. And so we pray for the teacher. And we pray for the receiver. You should be praying in your own hearts, God, open my heart. Let me be humble. Let me receive it. And I'm praying, God, will you by your spirit illuminate this into the minds and hearts of your people that they get epigenosis, the full knowledge of what this is. And it's not just academic, but you are beholding the Lord Jesus Christ and that you would be changed. It's spiritual thoughts being joined by the Spirit of God. That is what we want. And because God loves his church and Jesus loves his bride, they've given gifts to the church. And one of those gifts, I, I want to make sure that you don't lose sight of this. It's just one of the gifts he gives to elders who will teach the word of God and refute those who contradict this morning in Titus 1 verse 9. Those who will hold fast the faithful word of God. They'll hold it and they will sow it again and again with great patience. And this is the truth that accords with godliness and will produce these kind of men and women. So let's go before God and let's pray that he'll meet us here in Titus chapter 1, verse 9. Father, we come before you and I thank you for the way you've ordered and structured this church. I thank you that you, Jesus Christ, you gave your royal divine blood for this church. God, you have bought us and therefore you're the head of you're where everything points. You are our hope. You are our salvation. You're our Lord, Jesus Christ. We pray this word that we will hold to it, that we will teach it from every angle and that it will put you on display. God, that people will look and they will see the Lord Jesus Christ. They will see their God. Father, I pray uh, that our, our leaders will never be moved away from this. God, I thank you that uh, you are giving us teaching and example and understanding. And I pray again that every heart would say, I want to be this kind of man. I want to be this kind of woman. God, I, I pray that they want the character that we looked at last week and that the men of the church who are called to be teachers, God, that they will um, rise up. They'll be done with lesser things and give heart and mind and soul and voice to serve the King of Kings. God, meet us here now as we open up this word. Illuminate it to your people's hearts. I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Look with me at verse 9. So the elder then, the last quality we'll look at this morning, is he's to hold fast the faithful word, which is in accordance with the teaching, so that he will be able both to exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. And so this is the last trait uh, that should be for one who's appointed for elder. And I want to look first at this hold fast, the faithful word, which is in accordance with the teaching. I think this is the real culprit in the church today for the reason the church finds itself in the state that it is in. We, we have turned away from holding fast the faithful word, and we're turning to sermonettes. 
We believe that singing grows us more than teaching the Word of God. We want stories. We want emotionalism. We want the miraculous. I want what's relevant. I want what's palatable. The church is slipping away from holding fast to the faithful Word of God. Strong, passionate commitment to this truth. The word hold fast, it means to cling, to hold tight. You cannot be moved away from it. I was watching a, a thing on Facebook a while back where there was a mother and, and some robber came into the store and was trying to steal her baby. And I mean, literally, she was holding to that child as this guy was dragging her across the floor all the way out. And all I could think of is she's clinging. She's, she, she, this is her baby. You're not taking my baby away. I won't let go of it. And we have something better than a baby even in the Word of God. And he's saying, elders, you hold to this. You cling to this. You are not moved away from this word. I like what one preacher said. This is not just a commitment to inspiration that, that this Bible is God-breathed, every word, but it's a commitment to singularity. It's a commitment to the word and nothing else. Be, hold fast to that faithful word. Faithful means reliable, dependable, sufficient, trustworthy. It, it is sufficient for every need that we have, and I am convinced it is God's Word, and it's the only thing that will produce godliness and, and get us to that blessed hope that we're going to be studying here in Titus. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm convinced it's the only thing that can save a man. And so when we get that, is I'm not going to play around with all the world's thoughts and different things. This is the power of God to bring men unto salvation. And so the elder has to be convinced of this, and he, he won't sell it. This will be his commitment day in and day out, in season and out of season, whether it's popular or unpopular in our culture. And right now in our culture, it's unpopular. And he won't let go of it, and he'll preach this word no matter what. This is a passionate cherishing of the gospel. We know this gospel. We believe it. We love it. We hold it fast. I've spent my whole Christian life seeking to grow in this gospel. And this day, this morning, it's the most beautiful that I've ever seen it. We can't be like the spirit of the age, just chasing after every new fad and teaching. We stay on the old paths. We live in the gospel every day. I, you will never grow out of it. You will grow into it. Do you ever cry out with Paul and say, who will deliver me from the body of this death? I need the gospel. I need the gospel every day. I will not be moved away from it. I need it until my last breath. And I beg you as a church on my deathbed that you will come, family, and sing hymns and read the word of God to me as I breathe my last. I want hymns being sung. I want the word being reminded again to hold fast and to treasure this gospel. And I promise to do that for any of you with your respirator going to come. We have the sure word of God, and I want us to die with it. I want us to, to, to die. It's that sure and that steadfast. And so I'm not going to be drawn into a, a social gospel, a moral gospel, where we're just going to change moral behavior and entertainment gospel. We're, we're going to preach this gospel until we can't. Today, I, there's a lot of talk about the gospel. It's a very popular thing to talk about, but it seems to be very little preaching of it. I had a guy I went to hear preach, and, and he talked about the gospel his whole sermon, and he even changed his voice when he said it. He, he said, the gospel. And he, and he said it 36 times, and he never preached it. And then there was an altar call at the end, and a bunch of people went forward. What are they? I don't even know what they were going forward for. Preach the gospel. My prayer is that the teachers in this church, that we will teach and preach so you are never left with the idea that you can save yourself. And so we need to preach the gospel. The gospel that says you were born into this world by the sin of Adam. You are born spiritually dead. You're separated from him. You're, you're by nature now. You're, your flesh rules and controls. The world has a hold on you. The devil is, is your leader you come into this world with self as the center reference point now. Everything's broken. Everything's twisted. You come into this world wanting to be God. We come then, God says, because of that, in John 3, the wrath of God is upon you. 
There's a God who's holy and he's just and he demands perfection and righteousness. And we come into the world so broken and sick and dead and defying him that I want you to hear this morning, a real wrath is upon you if you're in that condition. God is not winking at that. He's not happy with that. He's not going to ignore it. It is so serious that the wrath of God is upon you. And the gospel is that there's nothing you can do to get that wrath off of you. You can come to this church till the cows come home and it will do nothing for you. There's nothing you can do to get that wrath of off of you. And so in the fullness of time, God sent forth His Son, fully God, fully man, and He put Him up on a cross. And face to face now, pros theos, God poured out. Our sins are put upon His Son. And God pulls out His sword of justice and He unleashes His wrath. If I went to hell, I would have to spend eternity trying to pay that debt. And in three hours, Jesus drained, the word is propitiation, he drained every last drop of God's wrath. Every last drop of God's wrath against all of my sin, past, present, and future, because God is not bound by sin. And then Jesus Christ came and he lived a perfect life. And he, he lived, God demanded perfection, and I could never give it. And his own son came and he perfectly gave it. And now God will put me in Christ and he'll treat me as if I lived that life. So I want you to know, believer in Christ, right now, the righteousness of Jesus Christ is put to your account. God looks at you and he's, he says, you're accepted. You're approved. And that you're, every sin you've ever committed, Jesus Christ said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Well, you're getting justice so that I can give you mercy. And I give mercy to all of your sin. I separate as far as the east is from the west. I will remember it no more, says God. And Jesus Christ then died as that sacrifice. And God raised him up on the third day to declare that there is salvation in no other name. He conquered sin. He conquered the enemy. He conquered death. And now the one who will repent and say, I, I have tried to be God. I have lived for myself. I'm, I, my center reference point is me, and my whole life has been that, and I'm destroying everything around me because of that. And this morning, to repent for wrong thinking about this God and wrong living and turn to Jesus Christ alone and believe in Him, that He alone has accomplished salvation, and in Him it's finished and then there is no other, and I look, and I put my trust and my hope in him alone. And God says that person is justified. God now declares him righteous. You're not guilty. You're reconciled with God. He adopts you into his own family, and you're brought into Trinitarian love with a certain guaranteed promised hope that now when you die, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ, and you'll inherit God forever. That's the gospel. And I will teach it and preach it again and again and again because we need to believe it. And since I've been a pastor, so many stop short of believing this. I meet more people who understand the doctrine but have never believed it. And so as a pastor and one of your elders, I, I just, I will never I, believe it. Will you believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and just quit living out there and knowing all this but never being joined to Jesus Christ? Do you believe what I just preached? Believe the gospel. Believe upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. That's the gospel. So why? What reason? Why do we hold this so fast? Paul says this, so that you'll be able to exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. I want to look first to exhort in sound doctrine. Here I think is the primary task of the elder. Not the only task, the primary task. We are to be teachers and preachers of this word then. And I want to show you how consistent Paul is in this as we're looking this. I told you Titus is a pastoral epistle and there's three of them. Uh, and, and he's handing off the baton, so to speak, as he's about to die to these younger men. And teaching these young men what, what is required of them. How can they be faithful in this calling? And so I just want to show you how clear this is uh, in these pastoral epistles. So if you'll just flip back two books to 1 Timothy. And if you don't have your Bible, you need to start bringing it. I heard someone this week say, if you don't bring your Bible, it's because you think you memorized it all. Okay? So bring your Bibles, unless you got a phone, which I still hate. But if you got it, pull it up. 
if the electricity or the whatever it is that goes out, my Bible's still going to work. <clears throat> so turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4. <clears throat> Excuse me. And just look what Paul says to Timothy in verse 6. In pointing out these things to the brethren, Timothy, you'll be a good servant of Christ Jesus, constantly nourished on the words of the faith and of the sound doctrine which you have been following. Jump down to verse 11. Timothy, prescribe then and teach these things, sound doctrine. Let no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, show yourselves to be an example of those who believe. Until I come, give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation and teaching. Do not neglect the spiritual gift within you, which was bestowed on you through prophetic utterance with, with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery, the elders. Take pains with these things. Be absorbed in them so that your progress will be evident to all. Let these doctrinal truths be filled and flowing so your life will be changing like everything we're seeing in Titus 1. So verse 16, then pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Persevere in these things, for as you do this, you will ensure salvation both for yourself and for those who hear you. Chapter 5, verse 17. The elders who rule well are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. Flip over to 2 Timothy. I want to look at chapter 1. I want to begin reading in verse 10. Chapter 1, verse 10. I love the sound of those pages turning. <laughs> Verses just clicking something. But now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. For which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher. For this reason, I also suffer these things. I'll suffer anything for this gospel. But I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I'm convinced that he is able to guard what I've entrusted to him until that day. I, I hold it fast because I know this is going to work. Verse 13, retain the standard then of sound words which you have heard from me in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus, guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure which has been entrusted to you, the gospel. Chapter 2, verse 2. The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. We've started a whole ministry by that name. 2 Timothy 3, 16. Everybody has probably memorized this passage, but it's important. All Scripture then, it's inspired by God, it's breathed out by God, and therefore it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be adequate and equipped for every good work because he has this sure word of God. And then chapter 4, verse 1. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead. And by his appearing in his kingdom, here's your call, Timothy, preach the word. Preach it, be ready in season and out of season. There's times you're going to be in season, there's times you're going to be out. Preach this word. Reprove with it. Rebuke. Exhort. And do it with great patience and instruction. Don't grow weary. Just keep preaching it again and again. For the time is going to come when they will not endure sound doctrine, which is our day and age without a doubt. They don't want that anymore. I don't want to sit and wrestle and learn truth and try to understand it and all of that. They won't endure it. But wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. They'll preach what they want to hear and they'll give them what they think they need. And what they will do is they, verse 4, they will turn away their ears from the truth and they will turn aside to myths. That Greek word is fancy stories. They're going to turn aside to fancy storytellers and emotionalism and all of those things. But you be sober in all things, endure hardship and do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. 
Titus 2.1, but as for you, speak the things which are fitting for sound doctrine. And so I want you just to listen to the words that Paul used in his letter to Timothy and Titus. Prescribe and teach. Give attention to, exhort and teach. Do not neglect. Persevere in these things. Work hard at preaching. Instruct them so that you might build up the church in godliness. It's hard to miss what the church of God is called to do then, the elders of the church. And I look, go back to Titus 1, verse 9. So hold fast the faithful word, and we are to exhort and sound doctrine. The word exhort is para kaleo. Kaleo means to call. Para means to come alongside. And so here it is. We're, we're to come alongside. So this isn't haughtiness or arrogance. You come alongside. You encourage. You speak truth. You bring truth to bear into every situation. I have one string on my banjo. Every problem you have can be healed in Jesus Christ. Preach him just again and again and again to conform to godliness. Come alongside tender, compassionate, powerful teaching and preaching for change. So the pastor must be a man of the word. He must, last week, he must be a man of God. And he must bring truth to the flock to grow them up into the head. And so young men, give yourselves to your teaching to know how to handle this word rightly. After today, there's a meeting in that back room of our training institute that's going to start to teach you how to handle this Word of God faithfully and accurately. Come, give yourselves to that. Give yourselves to know how to handle this Word faithfully, to know the Gospel, how to, how to sow it into every heart and every situation is what we want to train you in. So it's not just preaching and teaching it. It's sitting at a, at a graveside. It's sitting in a hospital. I want to come and take this Word and sow it and care and bring it to every heart. The power of it in your own life. If you don't have the power of the Gospel in your own life, you've got nothing to preach. The power of it to save you and to sanctify you. Give yourself to this. Listen to Colossians 1. Of this church, Paul says, I was made a minister according to a stewardship God bestowed on me for your benefit, that I might fully carry out the preaching of the Word of God. That is the mystery which has been hidden from, from uh, the past ages and generation, but now has been made manifested to his saints, to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So we proclaim Him, Him, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom that we may present every man complete in Christ. And for this purpose I labor, the Greek word is to fatigue, I labor to the point of fatigue, striving according to His power, which mightily works within me to just keep preaching Him the glories and the beauties of Jesus Christ, and as people look upon him, they will be changed into his image. So here's the calling of an elder, and here's the gift of an elder. We take great pains in exhorting and sound doctrine, which Jesus is the fulfillment of all of it. And so we give ourselves to this in season and out of season, whether our society wants it, whether even you want it, we, we keep day in and day out in every place in this church is to just keep sowing this word again and again. I want to read you a quote from one of the great saints of our day and age, John Stott. John Stott said this, Expository preaching, and that would be opening up the Word of God and going verse by verse through it, which we attempt to do here at the church. Expository preaching is a most exact discipline. Perhaps that's why it's so rare. Only those will undertake it who are prepared to say as the apostles, it's not right for us to give up studying to serve the tables. We will devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the Word. The systematic preaching of the Word is impossible without the systematic study of it. It will not be enough to simply skim by some verses in daily Bible reading, nor to study a passage when only we have to preach from it. We must daily soak ourselves in the Scriptures. We must not just study as through a microscope of the linguistic minutia of a few verses, but we must take out our telescope and scan the whole expanse of God's Word, assimilating its grand theme of divine sovereignty and the redemption of mankind. 
Spurgeon said, it is blessed to eat into the very soul of the Bible until you come at last to talk the scriptural language. Your spirit is flavored with the Lord's of the word. So elders, we are to be men of the word of God to get at it and take great pains in studying and growing in this word that it's changing us. Therefore, we will lead to change the brethren. Hold to sound doctrine. Secondly, in verse 9, there's always going to be false teachers in our midst, and there'll, there'll always be wolves. It took me a while to, I, I knew that, but it took me a while to believe it was really going to be sometimes friends. Refute means to show them of their error, to try to correct them, to, to, to be able to bring truth, to show them here's where you're not thinking right according to God's word and try to refute it and try to correct it. And then the, he said, Paul said, there's going to be wolves that are going to come into your midst as well and they're going to be needed to be dealt with more aggressively. There's times where a wolf may even need to be shot. Listen to what Titus says in chapter 3, verse 10. Reject a factious man after a first and second warning knowing that such a man is perverted and sinning, being self-condemned. And so there'll be times where the elders are going to have to reject a factious man coming in trying to sow false truths. And so we are to refute those who deny the gospel and the truth of this word. So I see it in two ways. They come in and they try to deny that it's content. And we fight for the content of the gospel and they'll come in and they'll try to deny its implications, the implications that come out of the gospel. And so what is Paul's message throughout this epistle is who Christ is and what it produces in his people. Truth of, of the gospel and it produces godly living in his people. And so we fight for that. In Jude, Paul calls us to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. Listen to Jude 1.4. For certain persons have crept into the church unnoticed, those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness, which is lawlessness, uh, a not godliness that we're looking at in this uh, epistle. And they deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. They've perverted the grace of God, and they start saying you can live any way you want because you're under grace, and they start sowing this false message. And what they did is they denied our only master and Lord. So, so get this. To promote lawlessness, you've got to demean Jesus, who's our master and our Lord. And you can't promote righteousness or godliness without preaching Jesus Christ. The two seem to be married uh, in Jude. And so, therefore, we preach Jesus Christ, and we refute those who contradict in doctrine and in application to godliness. That is a calling of the elders to guard that and protect that in this flock. And so, the elders must preach the gospel and the truth of this word and refute all who come up against it in doctrine or practice. And I want to close out with, I think, probably the best words we could ever find on this subject, and it's going to come from Paul himself. Uh, this is in Acts 20, verse 17. I want you to listen. And Paul says, From Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called to him elders of the church. And when they had come to him, Paul, he said to them, You yourselves know from the first day that I set foot in Asia how I was with you the whole time, serving the Lord with all humility. So the, the, here's this humble apostle. I was serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials which came upon me through the plots of the Jews. You know how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable. And I was teaching you publicly from house to house. Whatever was good for you, I kept preaching it. And it wasn't just in public. I went even into your houses, house to house, teaching truth solemnly, testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now behold, bound in spirit, I'm on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions await me. All I know as I go in there is that they're going to beat me to a pulp. So why would you go? I do not consider my life of any account 
as dear to myself. I've been crucified with Christ. In order that I may finish my course in the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus, which is what? To testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that all of you among whom I went about preaching the kingdom will see my face no more. Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock, elders, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. That brings a weight to every elder's heart. You're shepherding the flock of God that Jesus gave his own blood for. You better not abuse it and you better be faithful to it. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise from our very midst, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. They always want someone to follow them. Therefore, be on the alert, remembering that night and day, for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among those who are sanctified. Amen. Guys, Titus 1, 6 through 9 can never be done in human effort. The gospel is the grace of God. And Paul said, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And so the truth of God's word that has taken hold of me is changing me. And therefore, it's, it's that word that I proclaim and teach and preach and study to let it dwell in me richly. And you'll remember what I said last week. This is a call to all of us. So that this isn't a call just to, the character is what every man should be seeking to become. And some of you are going to be leading your homes and teaching. Every one of you should be devout in this. This is what makes these kind of men. And this is what will make you that kind of a man or that kind of a woman. And Titus 2, to be a woman of the word as well. Give yourself to this Bible. Give yourselves to know it. I don't know what's happened to the church, why that has become weird. Give yourselves to know this word and to re be renewed in it and to dwell in it and let it dwell richly in you. Turn off your TVs after the Olympics. <laughs> Godly things are going on in the Olympics. The gospel's going out in a lot of ways. But I just, at the end of the day, I, don't be known to be able to quote all the movies and quote all the TV shows. Don't you want to be known for quoting the Word of God? And just be done with lesser things. And so this isn't legalism. This is love to Jesus Christ. Let, let's dig in and let this Word dwell and fill us and transform and change us. Let it dwell in you richly. And fight with me the temptation of wanting something new and different. Will you fight with me for that? There's nothing new or different. Fight. Let's fight together to hold to this word, the old paths, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and not keep chasing all the nonsense that's all around us and all the emotionalism. Fight the spirit of the age. The spirit of the age that has turned away from this word, even in, in churches. And so I cry that we would be men and women of the book and that we would find that Jesus Christ is, is what this book is points to in the glory of the gospel and unto his Father's name. And so may we seek to be conformed to godliness. Don't be satisfied with anything else but being conformed to the image of Christ. Don't play with just external religion. And as we're going to learn in more detail what that looks like as we go forward more in Titus. And so I, I want you to pray for your elders. They, they need grace. And they need protection. They, they need God. But they, they need to be committed to paying attention to ourselves and to the teaching of this word. That anyone who stands up here or teaches in any class, if you ever feel like it's half-hearted, it wasn't studied, you know, don't, don't accept that. Don't, don't accept that. That we, we, we labor and we, we seek to keep putting forth the glories of God 
in this word in the face of Jesus Christ. So I, I pray for the young. We got a lot of young men that want to enter into this training institute, and I want you guys to be praying for them. They're, they're willing to give up their lives, their time, their schedules. They're, they're going to dig in and go after this with everything. And as a church, let's, let's be praying for them, pouring into them, and doing everything we can to help them uh, journey into this so we can hand the baton off to them and plant churches and send out missionaries and continue to take this gospel everywhere we can for the, the elect to come and believe upon the name of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, I thank you. I thank you for the sweet reminder in Titus 1.9. God, we do. The, I pray for the leaders of Southside Bible Church. Lord, we are very aware of the need of the gospel in our own hearts, uh, and therefore the need of the gospel in the hearts of those we shepherd. And so, Father, I pray it would be done in humility. Lord, when we know what we are in the secret place before you, it is hard to be haughty. Uh, there's just a, a brokenness, and there's a, there's a beauty in Jesus Christ who covers me. There's a beauty in this Savior. We just, we can't say enough about him. I just, I wish I had a, 10 more languages to try to proclaim Jesus Christ. Uh, or I wish I had a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. Lord, we, we, love, we love you. And we, we pray that we will be devoted and we will keep seeing more and more of your beauty in this word. God, that we would never settle for anything but the word of God that reveals you. And so we just continue to say, God, meet us um, by, the, by your spirit, illumining this word to us, transforming and changing us into the image of Christ. Truth that transforms, truth that will make us put you on display where the world will look and say, surely God is in this place. And so I, I pray for your power, your grace, your gospel to rule and reign in our hearts. Lord, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for the beauty of gathering together. Uh, I thank you for these saints. God, I love them so dearly, and I thank you that they love you, and it's just a joy to shepherd those who are hungry for righteousness. God, we thank you for this, and it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen.